it's a great pleasure to be back here. Uh, and I would like uh, to thank uh, Rainer and his team for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to, to come here and to see not only the fantastic equipment, but also the very vibrant uh, and exciting atmosphere here. It's a true pleasure. Last time I was here, it was true Maastricht weather, but uh, I can tolerate that today it's uh, different. If you have been here in, on the symposium on, in uh, January, I have to apologize uh, somewhat. You will recognize one or the other of uh, the slides I'm showing. We try to be innovative, but uh, we don't have a full turnover within three months. So let's uh, start by having a, a, a look at uh, the current status uh, of uh, our ultra-fast MR, which is uh, which we call MREG. Here we are, which actually is a project which has been going on for quite a while. It uh, started uh, in 2005 uh, at ISMRM, uh, really more as an as a example of uh, where MR imaging may go in terms of imaging speed. And at that time, I didn't really think that this would lead uh, to some uh, real application. It was just an example that... Uh, well, imaging speed in MR is limited by gradients. We need gradients to get spatial encoding, but gradients also make everything slow. So if we could do imaging without gradients, we would immediately be infinitely fast. Uh, well, we could sample as fast as our ADC is sampling, so we could acquire images, images at megahertz rates, but of course, with the lousy spatial resolution of basically uh, uh, EEG uh, scan. Meanwhile, we have worked on uh, to add some additional gradients, kind of a homeopathic dose of gradients, to increase and improve the spatial definition uh, and uh, to get something which uh, ultimately actually does resemble images. It has already been uh, uh, discussed by Larry Walt. Why would we uh, bother to do functional MR faster than the hemodynamic response? Uh, uh, Larry gave uh, his uh, signal uh, processing engineering uh, uh, approach to that. Uh, I, 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 I would like to give another straightforward uh, uh, explanation why we should do that by just looking at uh, what, what is there at the high frequency. If we just sample uh, MR signal uh, at a high rate uh, of, uh, of 10 hertz or more, and if we do then a frequency analysis, we see uh, that... Uh, uh, at the high frequency, what if it's, it's, it's not noise. There's a lot of signal there, but the signal, it uh, relates uh, to physiological uh, 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 signals like breathing, like ECG, which may be interesting in themselves, but in terms of uh, analysis of a functional experiment, they are actually confounds. If you sample at the current uh, uh, rate of two seconds, uh, uh, that means uh, about uh, half a hertz, then you fold all that signals back into your sampling window, and uh, that means in the end, all these signals uh, which are clearly distinguishable uh, if you sample fast enough, they contribute basically to something which is noise because the signals are not exactly periodic, not exactly reproducible, they are very hard uh, to separate out if they have folded back. So the main incentive for doing fMRI faster is really to get rid of these signals to be able to detect them and to cleanly, can clearly separate them from the proper signal and that gives you an immediate uh, increase in sensitivity uh, by a, a factor of uh, three to five if you go down to the, the mass of it. So from the spectra, we derived very early on our target specifications. Uh, we, uh, we decided that in order to get rid especially of the higher harmonics of the ECG pulsatility, we should sample with 100 milliseconds. So 100 milliseconds should be the upper bound of, uh, of our uh, acquisition time. Of course, for, in order to do functional uh, imaging, we want to cover full brain, so that's uh, the second boundary condition we did, we did, and if you just sit down, what you can do to achieve that with MR, then you have immediately some uh, boundary conditions uh, uh, which you have to work with. Uh, if you want to do, do a TR of 100 milliseconds, uh, that clearly indicates you should do single shot 3D imaging, otherwise you will 
uh, just have a too heavy saturation effect. If you want to cover a 3D trajectory in 100 milliseconds, you have to go to nonlinear case space trajectories. You have to do some undersampling, which means you have to make use of uh, 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 the current uh, hot topic of uh, inverse iterative uh, image uh, reconstruction. So over the years, we have run through uh, quite a few of uh, trajectories. Uh, and uh, that was not just a, a, a random permutation. We learned for, on each step of what we should do. Initially, we thought uh, we should go for anything which is isotropic. Uh, but uh, recently, we figured out that actually a stack of spirals uh, gives uh, a, a very good handle on imaging speed while uh, having control over the artifacts. And just to confirm the famous saying of Steve, Steve Reeder, yes, we have so far three PhDs uh, working on these. And this is our current uh, workhorse uh, sequence. Uh, if you look at the images, they, well, they are really images. Uh, actually, that's more than I initially thought we would achieve. Uh, it's three millimeter isotropic resolution. Uh, and uh, even compared with the standard EPI with these parameters, it doesn't look bad. Of course, you get uh, uh, the, 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 the susceptibility artifacts, uh, uh, which you also see in standard EPI in the frontal brain and uh, at uh, the, the bottom of the brain. Uh, probably having more coils available would uh, help to get rid of uh, that. And uh, I don't want to talk much more about uh, the specification and the technical challenges uh, of that, but rather go into the two areas of applications which uh, we currently put uh, our main focus on, uh, and that is once to correlate the signal of uh, MREG with EEG signals, and the second is uh, the resting state fMRI. Uh, if we start off uh, with uh, the combined uh, MRG and EEG, uh, we have uh, for some time now uh, done a couple of studies with our epilepsy uh, department. They are one of the epilepsy centers in Germany, and uh, what the patients uh, typically uh, get prior to surgery is a very invasive procedure. They get uh, uh, cortical electrodes implanted to track down the location of, uh, of spikes over several uh, weeks in order to plan a surgery. And uh, we were uh, thinking that maybe we can at least, uh, in some of these patients, uh, spare them from this very in invasive uh, procedure by looking at whether we can detect uh, 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 spikes uh, with uh, MREG. And the first study we did was a comparison between our technique and standard EPI uh, to see where we are in terms of uh, performance. Uh, the data acquisition is synchronized with EEG, so Pierre Lemont, who is uh, running that project, has put a lot of effort uh, to make uh, the EEG truly MR compatible, which means uh, that not only uh, to, to reduce uh, the, 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 the gradient noise, uh, but to bring it to a level that it can be read as a normal EEG, which is, of course, necessary to identify the spikes we want to see. So the study I want to report on was certain patients with a very hot heterogeneous uh, 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 class of uh, epilepsies and seizure types. Actually, two of the patients had uh, uh, seizures uh, with foci, which are non-tractable non in, uh, in imaging. In the other patients, so there was uh, a focus at least uh, suspected uh, from, uh, from imaging. And we did sessions, 20 minutes uh, fMRI, EG, uh, uh, for each of uh, the both uh, techniques. So just some examples of uh, results just to give you, give you a feeling of uh, what we are getting. So this is uh, an example showing a right uh, frontal spikes uh, uh, showing up uh, in clearly in, in the MRG, uh, but uh, we, we, we did not find anything significant in the EPI. You see here, uh, this is the spike uh, uh, detected uh, in uh, the EEG, and we then used uh, this spike with hemodynamic modeling uh, to tease out uh, the location from the uh, two acquisitions. Further example is now a left frontotemporal spike, and uh, uh, again you see uh, uh, lots of activation uh, in the MREG, and I would like to point out uh, here, uh, which is true for, for most of the spikes, we do not only get 
uh, activation at uh, the, 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 the locus of the spike, but also uh, some activation outside uh, of this area, so some uh, long distance activations. Here we did uh, pick up in this particular case the sp spike also with EPI, but uh, with uh, much uh, lower intensity, with, with much uh, uh, lower uh, significance. Here is uh, a just uh, a set of examples of the correlation of uh, the spike uh, topography uh, with uh, EEG. And uh, if you squint your eyes, of course, EEG uh, has a lousy spatial definition. But if you squint your eyes, you can figure out that especially for the single focal uh, event, uh, you get a, a, a quite reasonable correlation uh, in the overall uh, uh, loca localization of the spikes, uh, uh, but uh, at some, uh, in, in some, especially if you have multiple, sorry, I have to fiddle that around. But in instances, especially if you have uh, uh, multiple uh, activations in uh, the, the, the MR, uh, it doesn't seem to correlate at all with EEG, and it's not quite clear why this is the case. Uh, the EEG should at least hit uh, 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 about the region. It may be true uh, due to the fact that EEG, of course, is sensitive only uh, uh, to uh, the, the activation vector of the deep pole in one uh, direction. Uh, with uh, uh, the high temporal resolution we get, we can actually map out the, the individual hemodynamic response uh, function uh, uh, responsible for uh, each uh, uh, event. Uh, so these are just uh, two examples uh, where we just uh, took the, the raw data, uh, throwing out some of the physiological noise, but uh, otherwise non-smoothed, and you can very clearly see that uh, with the MREG, you get a nice hemodynamic response function. We, we do see uh, that uh, some of the responses we get are positive, some are negative. Basically, uh, you see something in the EPI, but because of the low uh, temporal resolution, it's uh, not really clearly defined in the EPI examples. So with uh, the, the data we get, from the MRHG, we can actually measure and model the hemo uh, hemodynamic response uh, function uh, for each individual spike, so not only for one patient, but within the patient, uh, we can for each event uh, uh, really map out the response function. And uh, uh, you see here on this slide, uh, in combination and correlation with a canonical response function, that there's actually quite some variation uh, depending on the subject, but also depending on the brain region in that. And if you measure the response function, of course, this improves your analysis uh, quite uh, considerably. So this is some uh, summary result uh, which we got from that uh, study. Uh, we had uh, in the both uh, runs uh, more or less the same number of overall spikes, uh, so 29 in the EPI run, 33. In the MREG, we, we detected all of the spikes uh, uh, which we found during the MREG runs. We could detect also the localization, whereas uh, with EPI, we lost uh, an, uh, uh, quite uh, uh, a few of them, nearly 40% of them. Uh, we, we did uh, see there's a positive bold correlation as well as a negative bold correlation in other cases. And uh, very interesting, we, we find that there is uh, quite a, a high incidence of distant uh, bold activation, uh, both positive and negative. And uh, in, uh, we were especially interested in seeing how uh, these distant uh, uh, locations interfere uh, with the default uh, mode uh, network, and we saw uh, that uh, with the MRG we could actually see a very high incidence of negative bold in areas uh, which uh, uh, correspond to the default uh, mode uh, network. So, so there's a lot of information in that, and uh, we do think that especially looking at uh, how uh, the, the, the distant uh, uh, activation interfere with the brain state uh, may uh, be very useful in elucidating uh, the, the symptomatic, but also uh, 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 gives us a hint of how to aim uh, uh, the therapy uh, to minimize uh, uh, the, the, the clinical effects. 
So uh, let me now switch to resting state networks, and there's uh, been uh, already quite a number of presentations today, so I don't need uh, to tell a lot about uh, the basics uh, of uh, RSNs. Uh, what we did uh, is uh, uh, run a couple of uh, experiments, well, a, a couple of series of experiments in which we use our technique uh, and uh, then uh, do an analysis uh, first on the typical and normal 0.01 to 0.1 hertz uh, resting state networks. But since we have the high uh, temporal resolution, we also looked uh, at frequency windows, which are free from the physiological uh, constraints. So one lower frequency window, 0.5 to 0.8 hertz, but also uh, 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 a, a larger window, anything above 1.5 hertz, and to see whether we get any correlated uh, activity in the brain at this higher frequency networks. And uh, since we can uh, use the same experimental run to, to look at the different frequency windows, we can actually do a lot of comparisons of uh, what we see. Uh, the, the, the evaluation was pretty standard, so we used the GIFT uh, toolbox and we did what uh, basically uh, most people are doing in order uh, to do the evaluation, uh, identify uh, the, the, the networks, and then do some uh, statistics on uh, the higher order network characteristics like modularity and uh, other things. In order to get a, a reliability check of, uh, to see well how much information is there in uh, our data, how far can we drive that, uh, uh, can we do uh, 200 uh, components uh, like Steve Smith is doing in the Connectome project. So we did a ICASO on the data and uh, we found uh, that uh, yeah, about with 40 to 60 components we should be on the safe side. That's really what's supported uh, by our data. And actually there's not a big difference uh, in the various uh, frequency uh, windows we were looking uh, at. So these are, are just some experiments of, uh, of uh, some uh, uh, correlated uh, activations we found in the three frequency uh, window ranges. Uh, and uh, here I've selected uh, a, a few uh, uh, networks which uh, seem to appear at least qualitatively at all three uh, frequencies. Uh, there are also quite a number of uh, networks uh, which, are, which seem to be more frequency specific. And I think both findings are at least uh, to, to me, as a non-neuroscience uh, but scientist, pretty clear. It's not expected that uh, uh, the brain does anything in a pure sinusoidal manner. Uh, uh, so uh, any activity will have uh, uh, a rather broad frequency uh, response, uh, maybe with a main frequency there. Uh, so to see uh, different networks at different frequency, I think it's pretty clear. On the other hand, uh, uh, it is known from EEG that at different frequencies, actually different functions are uh, served uh, in, in the brain. So uh, we should not be surprised that we do get uh, different networks at different uh, frequency uh, ranges. So we did uh, some additional analysis looking for uh, connectivity between the networks, looking at modules of uh, networks. And this is just uh, uh, some uh, summary statistics of uh, uh, the findings. Uh, so if we uh, look at the modularity, at the connection strengths, basically it's a measure of uh, how strong a, a, a specific area in the brain is connected with any uh, of the networks. We do see overall uh, a good uh, uh, agreement in the different frequency ranges, but we also note some differences uh, that uh, there are uh, some nodes uh, which are very prevalent at the low frequency part and not so prevalent at the higher frequencies and uh, vice, uh, vice versa. So the purpose, uh, of course, of the exercise of uh, looking at uh, functional connectivity is to eventually combine that uh, with structural connectivity, which is, uh, of course, as uh, we have heard uh, this morning, uh, the goal of the connectome or one of the goals of the Connectome uh, project. Uh, so what we want to do, what we want to ultimately do, is bring together the information of functional uh, uh, connectivity with whatever we can learn about uh, uh, the fiber connections between different uh, areas. 
So that brings me uh, to the second part, which is, uh, well, uh, how can we optimize our uh, uh, structural connectivity to eventually combine that with the functional connectivity measures? What we have uh, uh, worked on for quite a while is an approach to do fiber tracking not based on local criteria, which is uh, what, uh, what most algorithms are doing, so not so much uh, going from a single voxel and then trying to connect whatever we find there uh, to longer strings, but go the other way around uh, and uh, uh, do a global optimization uh, in which uh, we, we try to, to get the overall configuration by uh, a, a one single step uh, global optimization in which we find all the fibers in one step. I've condensed basically what could be a one-hour talk into this uh, one uh, 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 slide here, uh, summarizing the work of Marco Reisert and Valery Kiselev. So basically, uh, the, 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 the machine which is driving uh, the global tracking is uh, an optimization procedure. It's not quite simulated annealing, but it's somewhat related by simulated annealing. So starting off uh, with having short chunks of uh, disjunct uh, fibers, which are uh, boiling around on an energy uh, uh, surface, which is uh, defined by our measurement, and then uh, having these uh, sticks uh, sticking to each other and uh, eventually cooling the system down, we, 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 we reach a low temperature region where not much is moving anymore and we get connected uh, uh, fibers. So in what, what is a bit dangerous about uh, uh, this cartoon here is so that it looks like we are uh, doing more or less a, a numbers game of having one-dimensional pipes uh, 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 floating around, but actually what, uh, what Marco over the last, uh, would say, one and a half years has very heavily put emphasis on is that in this optimization procedure, it's not sticks trying to fit, to fit local orientation distribution uh, profiles, but it's really a full physical modeling uh, of, uh, of, of using uh, 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 realistic uh, uh, values for the diffusion along the fibers, so really doing a physical modeling of this diffusivity along the fibers, uh, so in the global, both in the global uh, environment uh, of the whole fiber, but also at the local uh, scale. So uh, in, in the end, uh, the, the fibers uh, which, which he gets, he can uh, 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 go back and get exactly uh, uh, the, the measured uh, uh, diffusion uh, 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 data which, are, uh, which serve as the ground crew. So that this is really... Uh, an algorithm uh, which tries to uh, not only put in some strings, but uh, does really some neurobiological modeling of the tissue, and in this way is as, as, uh, as far as the data carry and to sustain it, it is a self-consistent modeling, which then allows also not only to, uh, to uh, extract fibers, but also uh, get all kinds of, uh, of other uh, measures like fiber density uh, and others directly from uh, the data. And uh, just to brag a little bit, uh, uh, the, the algorithm has won the Mikai Challenge 2011 by far in uh, comparison with other uh, algorithms. So some observations uh, of that. One is because this is a global optimization uh, and fibers uh, are, are really the result of a procedure which takes the whole fiber into account. Uh, there is, uh, we don't have any trouble in resolving uh, even complex crossings uh, of fibers. I mean, every pixel where you have a fiber crossing, that's just one pixel along the whole fiber. Uh, so even so, with our modest equipment, we cannot match what Larry Walt has or what the connectome people have in terms of the gradient. We have very normal uh, run-of-the-mill uh, gradients, but uh, in spite of that, with this uh, global tracking, we can resolve very uh, nicely high order crossing. So typically, uh, we have 32 fibers crossing each voxel. We also get a, a, a very nice uh, and straight fiber length distribution in the uncleaned data with an exponential decrease in uh, the fiber lengths going down to the very long fibers. Because of this global uh, nature 
uh, of the optimization, uh, we immediately see that compared uh, to standard uh, uh, algorithms, we get more lateral fibers uh, 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 of the cerebral uh, spinal tracts, uh, and also from the uh, cross callosal uh, connections, we get uh, a lot more laterals than with uh, standard uh, approaches. So uh, we, we can use that uh, to kind of make up for the fact uh, that we don't have uh, all these fantastic gradient systems we would like to have. And uh, I should say, in summer, we will get our Prisma, and we, will, uh, we hope we can get better there. So this is just uh, some example of uh, uh, what one can do with the data and one can do much more than just fiber tracking. So this is just uh, a study uh, run uh, of, on on a quite a large number of uh, volunteers to map out uh, the fiber density in the corpus callosum. And uh, actually, the group average looks exactly what you can read up uh, in the textbook uh, with the variation of the cross callosal fibers. In humans, no matter what we do, we have huge voxels. Uh, I mean, our voxels are even larger than voxels uh, uh, shown uh, by uh, by Camille uh, this morning, but still, if you have a one millimeter voxel, you still have thousands of fibers, uh, uh, two uh, uh, exons going through that. Uh, so we, we translated our methodology to the mouse brain because there we can actually achieve much higher spatial resolution. And since mouse exons do not shrink uh, with the same uh, degree as the brains uh, shrink, we have much less fibers going through, uh, which means uh, that uh, we are much closer to, uh, to get a, a true measure of uh, what's actually happening there. And just by visual uh, comparison, uh, you, you can actually see that with our uh, fiber tracking, uh, we can reproduce very nicely findings which we get, for example, for histology, uh, uh, just by, by visual uh, inspection. But of course, we want to do uh, better. Here's just an example I like to throw in because I find it uh, personally uh, very interesting. Uh, that was a study on a uh, real mouse. And a uh, real mouse is actually a mouse model uh, for uh, the development of the cortical layering uh, in the early stages of development. So it's nothing to do uh, really with, uh, with, uh, with uh, exons and fibers. Uh, so in, in the real mice, uh, they miss uh, this uh, relin molecule, which means that they don't get a, a, a proper layering. So the, 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 the neurons in the cortex, uh, they stay all over there. So there's no proper layering there. And it's actually surprising that this is, uh, well, they are a bit slow and a bit dumb, uh, but it's a perfectly uh, a living uh, organism in spite of this uh, disorganization. And uh, we thought, yeah, well, let's look at what's happening with respect to, to the development of the, the, of the white matter uh, tracts uh, uh, there. And we were qu quite surprised to see that already very early on in the, uh, in the development, uh, we, do, uh, uh, real, we do recognize that the fibers already deviate from the normal orientation uh, which they get. And uh, actually, they grow through the cortex, and then they find their target molecules from above, uh, which have been sitting there, which tells us uh, that, well, they somehow had to have the information early on that they will not find their target. And very early on in the development, uh, the, the growing of the, of, the, of the axons was taking a different path, which tells us uh, that uh, development of, uh, of the brain is uh, much more than just sniffing along a gradient uh, of uh, some uh, substance uh, like uh, like really. But uh, uh, to get back to uh, uh, the validation of fiber tracts, uh, we have uh, uh, for uh, a few months now built up a collaboration uh, with Professor Zillis uh, from uh, just over uh, the border in Jülich, uh, uh, who has uh, developed this very nice uh, a technique of using uh, polarized uh, light uh, imaging uh, for getting a direct optical mapping of uh, fiber tracts. And uh, if you look at the image, well, it looks uh, kind of similar to what we get uh, with uh, our uh, MR. And you can uh, nicely see and track out the various uh, 
uh, fiber tracts there, and we actually we made the comparison on the same animal. So we scanned them on our scanner, and then we sent the mice to his lab, and he did uh, the histological the workup and the polarized light uh, imaging. Of course, there are some differences. Uh, we have a much higher uh, uh, through plane uh, uh, resolution in, in the light imaging, so it's a one micrometer uh, slice, which actually in optical imaging, it's not an achievement, it's a limitation because you just can get deeper into uh, the tissue, whereas uh, even with a small animal imaging, we are limited uh, to a, a much thicker slices, 158 micrometer, and of course this gives rise to partial voluming, uh, so we do see uh, that uh, there's a lot of, uh, of fibers which we can just directly recognize, uh, uh, correspond to each other. Should also point out uh, that the matching of uh, the slices here is done more or less uh, by, by optical comparison uh, because during the histological workup, uh, we don't have a very, uh, very fixed references. So we try to match the slices as good as possible. And you do see even uh, with respect to quite fine tracts uh, that we do get uh, good correspondence we also see some areas where we do miss uh, fibers in the MR, which may be due just to partial voluming. Uh, we just don't see it. Uh, what, what's the really most astonishing uh, difference is uh, this, uh, this cross-diagonal fibers, uh, which are very prominent on, on the optical imaging, and we, we just don't see that in MR, and we are trying to figure out uh, uh, what's the reason uh, for that. And of course, in areas where one has a very fine uh, and, uh, and, and crany uh, structure, uh, we definitely suffer from partial voluming with uh, our approach. So we, we, we did the translation of the fiber tracking already uh, three years ago, uh, actually translating the resting state fMRI uh, to the mouse brain was uh, the bigger challenge. In that case, if you have tried to do it, uh, you know that uh, fMRI in mice is notoriously difficult. The mice have a different physiology, uh, so it's, uh, it's very hard to get even a good, reliable task fMRI. Uh, in the mouse brain, you have, have to worry, of course, about sedation, use the right kind of uh, sedation. Uh, but after quite a lot of work, uh, uh, Laura Hassan, uh, uh, and Anna Mechling uh, actually got uh, uh, the, the resting state uh, uh, analysis on the mouse brain running. And uh, if you compare uh, the, the areas which uh, uh, we found, uh, they, they map directly on uh, the, the areas you found in the mouse brain. Of course, there's much less uh, of those areas in the mouse brain. So the mapping is much more straightforward and we can do also some higher order analysis and see what are the most connected mouse brain regions. And we are uh, very happy uh, that we get around to get that quality of uh, data. So that brings us back to the challenge. Yeah, how can we now marry up the functional connectivity with the structural uh, connectivity? Well, that's still a struggle. And uh, you have heard uh, that uh, also in the previous uh, talks, it's not quite straightforward. And uh, uh, why that is so, uh, this is an illustration here where from our uh, fiber tracking, we mapped out the endpoints of the fibers found by the algorithm. And you see uh, that uh, most of the fibers tend to terminate in the gyri. And you uh, see very little terminating points in the sulci. And the same has been reported uh, from, by other groups for, for other uh, fiber tracking algorithms. And it just means uh, that uh, uh, the algorithms which were optimized to deal with the very complex uh, uh, structure of cables within uh, uh, the white mapper, netter, they just don't do well to detect the endpoints uh, of uh, fibers. There's not a good measure in the, uh, uh, in the diffusion tensor data on what would be the endpoints like. So what we really need uh, uh, to look at and to de develop is a good procedure to find the endpoints of the fiber, which probably requires that we use different algorithms. Uh, I mean, one, ex one straightforward example is uh, that uh, no matter how you do the optimization, 
you always put in some limitation to how strongly the fibers bend within white matter, and that is uh, 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 totally reasonable. But as we know from histology, once the, the fibers uh, uh, reach uh, the gray matter, this may be totally different. They very easily make a 90 degree turn and then end up somewhere in gray matter, whereas uh, if, if we keep that continuation uh, a criterion, then we just see that the fibers will continue uh, 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 to follow uh, our uh, 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 anisotropy pattern and will have a tendency to, in many cases, erroneously terminate only at the top of the gyre uh, where there's no way out and, uh, well, it, they have to terminate. So we need to work on getting a better match for, this, for these last few millimeters of our fiber tracts uh, to make really uh, a sensible combination of the structural and the functional MRI. So to, just to summarize, uh, now we can do whole brain fMRI with 10 volumes uh, per second. Uh, we still suffer somewhat from uh, susceptibility effects because our echo train currently is 70 milliseconds uh, at three Tesla, which is quite about tolerable, but we would like to have it shorter and we hope uh, that uh, with uh, the new system, we can finally use a very nice 95 uh, uh, channel uh, coil, which uh, we, we had built uh, at uh, Larry Walt's uh, lab, and uh, uh, this uh, should get, make, enable us to shorten the echo train and to get now susceptibility free imaging. We would like to get faster gradients, uh, but unfortunately, the tendency the manufacturers currently is to build strong gradients, to build gradients which are, which are linear over two meters, and that means they are uh, inherently limited in terms of uh, how fast you can switch them. And I think France should really work on a faster gradient. There's quite, quite a lot of open uh, uh, challenges. Uh, we still have to understand what is the physiology behind high frequency RSNs. I mean, the bold effect is slow, and we should not be able to detect anything beyond, uh, yeah, beyond one hertz. This should already be difficult uh, to get some signal. Well, but we get signals, but uh, we haven't understood what, uh, what are the signals due to. Uh, and as already mentioned, we need to find the true endpoints of fibers. There's, uh, apart from the gradients, there are technological challenges with the fast fMRI, the full reconstruction with our current algorithm takes about two minutes per frame per processor. So if you have many processors, uh, then uh, uh, you can still reconstruct your whole time series. Just remember, 100 milliseconds gives you lots of data. So it takes space on a, on a, on, on a, on a grid machine. But uh, actually, uh, uh, when I was here last time, I discussed with Reiner would be nice uh, to be able to have that performance for real time. And actually, and to me quite surprisingly, uh, we have uh, meanwhile uh, tweaked a little bit with the algorithms and uh, 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 did some preconditioning. And these are fir very first results of activation with 1.5 millisecond reconstruction time. So uh, we should be getting there. And that was, again, a very nice experience to me. Uh, if you remember, we started the MRHG by obviating this necessity of gradients, uh, not thinking this would be realistic. But jumping over that fence, we were much faster than we need to be, and we could go back and get these images here by obviating some of the assumptions leading to iterative reconstruction. We are now, again, much faster than we probably need to do, and we can work a little bit on getting improving uh, the quality. Okay, with that, I'm at the end uh, of my presentation. I would like to thank all the people in my lab uh, doing all the hard work, Carl Silis, for this very nice collaboration, and you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.